Welcome everyone to the last of our 2021 conversations on innovation. We're going to conclude the year with a very rousing conversation on a subject that is, I suspect, of great interest to many in the audience. And that is the subject of antitrust perspectives on innovation and competition. We have two incredibly talented and um, sophisticated individuals with us here today to discuss this subject. These are both professors who have deep experience both in antitrust economics and in government and therefore are ideally suited to discuss the many questions that all of us I suspect will have. First up, we have Dr. Fiona Scott Morton, who is the Ted Nirenberg Professor of Economics at the Yale School of Management, where she has taught since 1999. Fiona also holds courtesy appointments at the rank of professor from the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, the Law School, the Public Health School, and the Economics Department. Her areas of academic research include empirical industrial organization with a focus on empirical studies of competition. She has, in addition to all of her academic pursuits, also served at a very high level in government. She was the deputy assistant or attorney general for economics at the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. And um, she was, was there for several years during the Obama administration. She has been the recipient of many awards and is also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. She has a bachelor's degree from Yale and a PhD from MIT. Next up, we have Professor Carl Shapiro of the University of California, Berkeley Haas School of Business, where he is a professor both at the Haas School and at UC Berkeley's Department of Economics. He's also the Transamerica Professor of Business Strategy, Strategy Emeritus at the Haas School of Business. Carl also had the honor of serving as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division, I believe right before Fiona, and subsequently went on to be a Senate confirmed member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors during 2012, 2011 to 2012. Uh, Carl has many honors as well, and he is an editor and co co-editor of the Journal of Economic Perspective, Perspectives, a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and also an associate of MBER. He's published in, extensively in industrial organization, competition policy, patents, and the economics of innovation. So we are delighted to have these two extremely talented and distinguished experts with us to talk about antitrust issues in innovation and competition. So the subject doesn't need too much introduction. There's been so much discussion in political and policy fora about the potential need for greater competition in a variety of different industries in the marketplace and perhaps particularly in digital platform industries and the biopharmaceutical industry. Now, some of these arguments have a quote, big as bad type flavor. Um, and I think that that is probably not a general philosophy that our, our panelists are going to espouse, but there are very sophisticated arguments being made about competition issues um, of real concern raised by mergers and acquisitions and also by exclusionary behavior by dominant incumbents in particular industries. Interestingly, these days, the issues in the debate include not only traditional price effects and perhaps not so traditional dynamic effects, um, including competition, or excuse me, innovation effects, but also other issues, including harms to wages in labor markets, and then also particularly for certain digital platforms, the issues can include questions as, as broad as data privacy and security, news source diversity, and political accountability. 
For our purposes, we're going to start by focusing the conversation, at least initially, on potential effects of diminished competition on innovation. Then we'll talk about potential solutions to any innovation and competition challenges that we might see. And then also about how those possible solutions might incorporate or not incorporate, as the case may be, other challenges posed by particularly digital platforms. We're gonna go for about an hour in the formal question and answer colloquy. And I hope to weave in your questions, your audience questions throughout. So please send them throughout. More formally, after 1.30 or so, we will turn exclusively to your questions and go till about 1.45 with your questions. So with that, I'm going to start um, with a few questions for our panelists. And um, I, I think we are going to have a very robust discussion even before we get to audience questions. So Fiona and Carl have not only written much distinguished work on their own, but they've also co-authored work together, in particular, a 2020 paper for an NBER book that caught my attention entitled Antitrust and Innovation, Welcoming and Probing Disruption. Protecting. So it was a title. Protecting Disruption. Oh, Protecting, I'm sorry, Protecting Disruption, of course. Um, uh, as the title indicates, you agree on a lot of fundamentals, um, but I do want to, and this is where I was thinking probing, I wanted to probe areas of disagreement potentially and also talk about your separately authored work that touches upon these issues. So I'll start with a couple of level setting general questions about the relationship between competition and innovation. Uh, I believe you both say in that article that there's no necessary reason to believe that there's a tension between competition and innovation. In other words, that increasing the number of competitors beyond a certain number of competitors, say if we put those competitors on the x-axis, wouldn't necessarily lead to a diminution of innovation on the y-axis. So you wouldn't necessarily, as some economists have suggested, get an inverted U in terms of the relationship between the y-axis innovation and the x-axis number of competitors. So I wanted to start with that question and ask, why do you think that's the case given that in many um, circles, including where I tend to teach uh, the area of intellectual property, it's thought that quasi-monopolistic rents can fuel innovation and particularly costly innovation. Well, well, let me pick up on that. Thanks, Artie. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, look, you're, you're echoing ideas that I'm sure you know are really are often attributed to Schumpeter, right? Going back 70 years or more. Um, the notion that we see in many innovative industries, it's large firms who are innovating and they are expecting to or hoping and to get some sort of mar market position, durable market position, maybe even a monopoly as a reward. And of course the patent system has elements of that too, giving rewards that are somewhat monopolistic. Unfortunately, that, that very great idea of Schumpeter's has now been mangled and distorted. Um, I think largely on behalf of, of powerful companies who want to um, take anti-competitive actions. This is a problem. This is one reason antitrust is under, there's, a, there's such a raging debate today because so many bad ideas have taken root. And this, the idea here, the bad idea here is, oh, you don't want to have too many firms competing, otherwise innovation might fall. Right? That's, that's kind of your, your inverted view. So look, where does, first off, where does that idea come from? At some level, it's gotta be right. If you look around and say, I look, I'm here in Berkeley right now. I say, oh, there are a lot of restaurants in Berkeley, very fragmented industry. They're not innovating very much. You know, boy, that's, that's not so good. But I look at semiconductors and there's like three or four or five big firms and they're innovating like crazy. So I guess it's really a good idea to have these concentrated industries so we have more innovation. Well, come on, that's not a sensible comparison. Okay, so you do these cross-sectional analysis. The, the, 
let's get down to a practical policy question. One of two of those semiconductor firms want to merge. Okay, what they say, I believe me, I've heard it, and so has Fiona, because you've been at the Justice Department is, oh, there's you know, five firms, if we go down to four or three or four to three, fewer firms, more innovation, look at that inverted U thing, right? No, five is too many, very bad. Well, you, why don't we explore that question in that industry? And this is what I did um, in a paper about 10 years ago that I'm uh, called Competition and Innovation, Did Arrow Hit the Bullseye? And really pitted this Arrow's idea that you need disruptor, you need disruption, new, new firms to come in to innovate as opposed to the Schumpeterian idea. And what I say there is instead of looking at the number of firms, think about it, at least think, take for a merger, ask yourself, the key thing is to have what I call contestability, which is multiple firms that feel if they don't work hard, they're gonna lose the next generation. It's at risk. If it's the incumbent, they figure we can't sit on, we can't sit still, somebody's gonna overtake it. If it's an entrant or disruptive entrant, of course, they're hoping to pick up a lot of share. So that notion of contestability for future business is the key thing that drives, that creates an incentive for innovation. And you want to, you want that to be strong. Appropriability is also important. If you spend a lot of money, and this is your idea of, you know, how do you get a return, right? You need to have some appropriability. And so, so that comes into the analysis. And we have to consider synergies that two firms might come together and be more capable in innovating than, than either of them were alone. So, so those are the principles. Um, but the notion that having fewer firms will inherently lead to less innovation, it's not right. Um, it's really this contestability. And that's why the sequel to my paper, which is the one you mentioned with Fiona and Julia Federico, uh, who was at the time at the European Commission, we really developed that further in terms of disruptive entrance, particularly. And uh, so this U, if you hear about this U inverted U-shaped curve, put it out of your mind. It's a zombie idea that should have been killed. I thought I killed it 10 years ago, but I was not effective. And so um, if, you, if somebody says that, you say, wait a moment, go read my paper and you'll see that it's mistaken. Uh, well, hey, you know, on. you wanna to add to that? Yeah, just one observation. Do the intellectual experiment to yourself instead of comparing restaurants to semiconductors, okay? Hold the industry fixed for your experiment. What would innovation in food be like if there were one giant monopoly restaurant in Berkeley? Okay, not, not what we've got now. Right? What we've got now is better. Same thing with semiconductors. Let's merge all those semiconductors together into a monopoly. How would the pace of innovation be affected? You can see appropriability would be high, it's true, but it's high now because in semiconductors, it needs to be high. There's an equilibrium phenomenon where you don't have a thousand semiconductor makers. There's a reason we have five. And that incorporates this, this appropriability idea that Carl was talking about. So you really need to do the experiment of concentration holding everything else fixed and not doing things like comparing restaurants to semiconductors. So is the argument then that in particular industries, um, we will generally be at a good equilibrium and then changing that equilibrium through a merger might be problematic. And that leads to the, the question about mergers and acquisitions upon which there's so much focus. Um, uh, specifically, are horizontal mergers and in industries that have reached some sort of good equilibrium a bad idea? And how do we differentiate those from vertical mergers? And how do we think about all of that in terms let's, of? Let's hang on for a second, Carl. I think Carl needs to has some opinions about the setup. Uh, okay. All right. Well. Look, you said a couple times already. Oh, an industry that's reached a good equilibrium, it's in a good spot. What does it mean? Okay. What we in practice, if you're doing antitrust enforcement, you see the industry. There's a certain number of firms. They've been innovating, they whatever. We don't know if it's good or bad, particularly. I don't even know what that means. Okay, what we what we have to do is say, well, there's a merger proposed. Do we think that will make it better or worse? Okay. okay. So okay. I just I just I, I was reacting to the language. There shouldn't be any packing and like, oh, it's in a good place, so maybe we shouldn't let it change, or it's in a bad place, so it has to change. We don't know that. We can, we're comparing where it is with where they might wanna go. And, um, uh, and, and we're often looking practice, we're talking about mergers, it might be five to four, it might be four to three even, right? Um, so it's not two of 20 
firms need to merge to be bigger to innovate, those mergers aren't even being looked at, right? 20 to 19. So you really be want to talk about tight knit industries. And, you know, for all we know, it's already way too concentrated. So I don't want to assume it's in some good place to start with. That was my <laughs> and, and, and my 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 fault for for making a faulty assumption in that regard. Um, uh, by the way, just one um, logistical intervention. If you start to have questions, please use the Q and A function on your screen, and uh, you can submit through through that function. Um, Fiona, I believe you had something you wanted to say. No, I was just. I just knew that Carl was going to say. <laughs> um, well, then I do want to probe you on the issue of horizontal uh, M and A versus vertical M and A, regardless of of equilibria and, and so forth. Um, how do we think about innovation effects in those two different contexts, and do we think differently? Is there a distinction to be drawn? Um. It only in the sense of the theory of harm that you're worried about. Antitrust exists to protect what I'll call horizontal competition, the head-to-head -head competition. Competitors who are seeking to have the same customer uh, base. That, 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 that's what we're ultimately going after when we enforce the antitrust laws. Now, the way that can be messed up is by those horizontal competitors forming an innovation, a, a cartel to shut down innovation or by merging to, uh, in a way that would shut down innovation. But it's also possible that there could be a vertical theory of harm. That is to say, a supplier to that industry or a downstream distributor from that industry uh, forecloses others uh, and therefore disrupts the innovation process that would otherwise be occurring between them. I recently testified for the FTC in the Illumina Grail merger, and that was the theory of harm there, where there are multiple firms, including Grail, trying to develop cancer tests and only one platform on which the test can run. So if you are a cancer test maker, there is no way to get to the end consumer without accessing the platform, the, 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 the test machine. And the test machine maker bought one of the test uh, developers, one of several. And so then, of course, a natural worry is, will the other test developers be able to carry out their business because they need access to the platform? The platform now has a strong financial incentive to sell its own test. So that's a, an example of where a vertical linkage can screw up innovation in a horizontal uh, market context. So we need to worry about both of these channels. Let me give another example that I think may help. Um, I'll use semiconductors again, since I've studied that industry a fair bit. So Intel for years was you know, the dominant firm in, in certain types of um, microprocessors in particular. And uh, there came a point where we kept adding functions to the microprocessor. And this would happen for decades. And at some point, they wanted to add a lot of graphics capabilities. So there was a separate graphics chip and a microprocessor chip. So they decided, well, should we make our own graphics chip or should we buy another company that's good at it? They went to buy another company that was Chips and Technology. This may be 15, 20 years ago, I don't know. And so this would be a vertical or complementary merger. And there's a lot of reason to think that could be good because then they can make their better their chip and expand it and compete with others. Um, so that's quite different than buying a horizontal competitor. Okay, you're not directly Harm, you know, taking out a competitor or disruptive venture, whatever. But you're still worried. They buy a critical maker of graphics chips. Their competitors might not have good access to graphics chips. And then you have affected horizontal competition, as Fiona used the term. So it's a very different analysis um, uh, in vertical versus horizontal. Um, and um, also, I just say his historically, there's a lot of examples of very innovative firms. Um, buying a, companies from adjacent markets in order to expand. You know, this could be a car company now buying a battery maker, right? So that they, they integrate. Uh, so, so we have to recognize that's an important part of the innovative process, but we'd also think, well, why don't you, why don't you develop it yourself rather than buy somebody if, if your competitors rely on that company you're buying? Those are the questions or key, some of the questions. 
And, and let me bring up a third category, which is really in the forefront of everyone's mind today, which I'll call conglomerate mergers. Carl and I immediately, when you said vertical mergers, went to actual vertical chains. I have a test and then I put it in a machine and I give it to a customer. I have a, a chip and it does this and it goes to the customer. But what about Facebook buying uh, something that isn't in its chain of production and isn't doesn't seem to be a horizontal competitor and it's just sitting out there undefined. We call that a conglomerate merger, or we used to. I don't think it's a great word, really. But what the game, the name of the game there would be is to work out whether that thing, which is today apparently not head-to-head -head competing, will be a head-to-head -head competitor or part of the vertical chain in the future. And when you have a nascent competitor that is uh, present in the marketplace and therefore is going to be contesting those sales tomorrow, so the contestability Carl talked about could be happening now, but it could be happening in the future, that's a kind of merger we would also be worried about because it could reduce innovation by decreasing contestability in the future. And you could, Facebook, the example, you could put WhatsApp in there as it wasn't directly competing against Facebook's main platform when they bought it. They were competing against Facebook Messenger, but not so much their main platform. And, but you'd wonder, well, what would WhatsApp grow to on their own? And is Facebook taking out a future competitor, even if currently they're not a direct, they're not a current horizontal direct rival. Um, we're, I think both of you and I are very concerned that too many of those mergers have been allowed uh, and it's quite hard to stop them. Maybe we'll return to that, but that's that's a very live issue, particularly in tech sector. So uh, let's tackle that right now because I think that a lot of people are interested in that question. And the whole issue of what constitutes a nascent competitor, I think is a fascinating one because as you've already suggested, um, they may not be in a position to be either or, or horizontal horizontal competitor or even necessarily in the vertical chain at the time that we begin to get worried. So how do we think about the uncertainty involved and putting forward the efforts we need in terms of gathering data? Um, because you say in your paper, um, the 2020 paper, quote, the lack of data does not indicate the absence of an antitrust issue. Um, and that's I'm sure true, but absent data, what can be done to build a case? And the example of nascent competition, I think, is a perfect situation to illustrate that problem. Well, uh, we have a problem today because the antitrust laws, I think, are fairly weak and have been weakened by the courts over the last 40 years to the point where burdens on plaintiffs are sufficiently high that we have problems when we get to places like this. When we get to, I mean, the, the way you would think about the problem is the error cost framework. It's a decision theoretic framework. I'm gonna make some mistakes. I'm gonna sometimes enforce when I shouldn't. I'm gonna sometimes not enforce when I should, but I'm gonna to try to pick a rule such that those are balanced, right? So that the harm on each side is equal. I'm not gonna constantly under enforce. The way we set up our burdens of proof uh, require, if it requires the government to show that in the future, the trend of technology will be such that WhatsApp is a future competitor, then you're placing a lot of responsibility on the government to know about technology and to be able to show that that technological trend is going to happen to the satisfaction of a court. And that might not be really a realistic standard if we're trying to get to the right answer, uh, which is we're, this is a risk and consumers should be protected from that risk. So one uh, solution that has been proposed in, by a number of people in this space is to change the burden of proof and place it onto the merging parties because they're the ones who understand the technology. They're the ones who are developing a strategy going forward. They're the ones who have a financial incentive that they want to merge and they have expertise and they can bring all of that into the courtroom and explain, actually the direction of technology is completely different and this shouldn't be of concern or, or not. Uh, and then, uh, and that might help us to get to a better place uh, more effectively. Well, let me give an example of how frustrating this can be. 
to those of us who are trying to protect competition. The FTC brought a case, this is 2015, against a merger. It was Steris and Synergy Health. And um, basically, you had one company that was pretty much dominant in the US in this area. It was a medical area. And the other company was big in Europe and was thinking about coming into the US to compete. Okay. So it wasn't so much even, it was more in antitrust speak, we call it a potential competitor, not so much a nation, but it had the product, they were well established, but they weren't in the US. Okay. So the FTC claimed, well, if we didn't do this merger, the European company would come in and we'd have this great competition. That would be much better. And they're choking that off. The company said, got up and said, you know, we were thinking about the US, but yeah, it turns out it doesn't work. We're not going to do it. Okay. So the court has to decide, well, if they're not going to do it, there's no case. And the court ruled in favor of the defense. Um, and look, somewhat it's just, well, that's the evidence in the case. You might say that's the way it goes, but it's reflection. I think people who, who are interested in enforcement, like that's a crazy decision because there was a lot of evidence they were planning to do it. And then somehow their plans evaporated after the merger came into place and they changed, you know, so, so it's like, wait a moment, can you, that's, that's cheating. <laughs> so so um, anyway, it's a very high evidentiary burden for the government. And I think as Fiona is suggesting one way to reduce that, um, because it's so hard, you, look, you're not gonna have data, very, very rarely you have data on what's gonna happen in the future, uh, products that haven't been introduced yet, particularly if it's more nation. And you also are gonna have, um, you know, you could have testimony for the companies saying, you know, no, we're, we're not gonna do that. It doesn't work anymore. So, so it's, it's a problem in terms of evidence. And therefore I think what we need is a lower burden of lower hurdle for the government to win those cases in some fashion. Can you talk a little bit more about how your invocation of error cost analysis ties into the burdens? Because this error cost analysis has a long and hoary pedigree as well. And um, perhaps you could elucidate what you may mean by uh, by why we should assume that the why some economists have assumed that errors in terms of less competition will always be corrected by the marketplace. Yeah, I, this is a funny one because it comes from 1970s lawyers who said, oh, look, markets will always fix themselves. But anyone who studied microeconomic theory for more than about 10 minutes knows that when a company obtains market power and has that rectangle of monopoly profits, that they'd like to keep it and that they're going to take actions and spend that monopoly profit to keep that monopoly profit. So the idea that it's just going to self-correct magically is contrary to our profession, what we know in our profession. And that's why we have a government to say, look, you can't take anti-competitive steps to get that market power. Um, so that's all very logical. And the fact that it's not the narrative in the press uh, comes from the fact that we, if you're a monopolist, you spend money to affect the press and to affect think tanks and to affect research and to create studies and so on. And um, no, these things don't self-correct. And if you're thinking about an error cost balance, you don't say, well, every time I'm not sure, I'll let everybody merge. That will be my rule, okay? That's gonna give the wrong answer. Just the same way if you said, every time I'm unsure, I'm going to block the merger. Okay, that would also give the wrong answer. We need to take our best estimate of the mean and hew to it, and understand that yes, of course, there's going to be errors. I mean, that that of course, but res our responsibility to consumers is to maximize expected utility and and do the best we can. Well, I have to step in here too. Look, this this goes back most notably to Frank Easterbrook's work in the '80s. It's, I wrote a paper recently, Antitrust, what, what, what Went Wrong, How to Fix It, where I, where I addressed this in some detail. But, but Easter book, you know, there's two things he did here in the error cost. Look, error cost framework, just decision theory. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that concept. But what did he do with it? He said two things that are clearly wrong. And yet we have Supreme Court justices citing this 40 years later. What are the things that are clearly wrong? First, Markets correct themselves quickly. So, you know, if you let a anti-competitive action go on, 
don't worry about it too much because things will fit. Well, where's the evidence of that? There's, he didn't offer any evidence. That was just an ideological assertion. And we know that's not true. Well, we theory says it's not true. So never, he didn't, there's no evidence and no theory. Yeah, so, so excuse me. So, um, so that's the, like, that claim Marcus would, and then the other thing is, in some sense, even more laughable, which is if the court um, does something that will be, um, uh, there's a ratchet where the court, you know, will just get, make things tougher and tougher in, inappropriately. And so you have to avoid that. Well, what's that about? The court was in the process of decades of making things more lenient. So, so it just, it just like, why are people even talking, talking? How did this last for 40 years? The only thing you can conclude, since it's not based on evidence, not based on um, logic or economics, you have to conclude it's based on effective either ideology and the interest of powerful companies to influence these things. I don't see how you can get anywhere else. I don't, how else could this have happened? How else, well, that's why it's happened. I, I just, I will assert that. So that relates to a question we're getting um, from the audience in in the Q and A already, and that is: so is the problem the way that the common law develops in antitrust? And so, it, I mean, both of you seem to be suggesting that it's lawyers that are prob the problem, not economists, which is fine by me. I, I have no <laughs> brief in favor of oh, lawyers. I'm not saying that. Economists have been, some economists have been very much <laughs> complicit. And in some sense, they're worse because they're supposed to be experts and they're, they're giving sworn testimony as opposed to advocates. So no, I am not, this is not a thing about economists versus lawyers in my view. I'm not I, saying I'm, that. I'm mostly joking about that. Um, well, I just want to set the record clear because <laughs> there's, there's, it's a sensitive right. area. But, um, but more specifically, in terms of the common law approach is there has been a lot of discussion about whether we need um, a more regulatory approach and whether you know the, the relevant agencies um, should move towards doing more regulation in in these areas because the common law has ended up not being has been stuck, if you will. Yeah, I think it's not the problem with the common the idea of common law. The problem is that we have appointed judges who I think are more interested in corporate profit than protecting consumers, and we have um, uh, and we have not uh, given enough direction in the law itself so that when those judges make a ruling that's not favorable to competition and consumers, we then have jurisprudence that subsequently gets built on. This is the common law process. That would be fine if it were correct and helpful jurisprudence, but it's not. So we've gone down a path that's not helpful and we could correct it, Congress could correct it by saying, you know, these cases are not not decided correctly and Congress has different priorities and judges we're going to now instruct courts on how to do it and keep going using common law. I think that would be fine. Another approach that you mentioned is to write down particular regulations. Um, that's uh, in many, there are many instances where that might be fine. I'll just tell you my concern with that approach is that there are an infinite number of tactics out there and many, many markets and industries. And so getting the rules right um, becomes a bit of a whack-a-mole moving target. And common law is very good in that way. Common law a judgment can say, oh, I see what you're doing is analogous to this other thing over here. And so we already know that that's illegal. And, and businesses understand that that's what's gonna happen to them. And so they don't perhaps try variants of something that has been prohibited by a past court. Whereas if a regulator writes a specific rule, they can just try something that's not written in that rule. So I worry a bit about being able to um, establish rules that are effective. Having said that, antitrust law we've got now is not effective, so nothing's working. So look, I, I have a lot of fondness for the common law tradition and process. Um, and the fact is antitrust law was messed up in a lot of ways in the 60s. And there was a common law process by which it extracted itself from that, okay? A lot of you know conduct that was pro-competitive was either questionable or even per se legal in some cases, vertical practices, for example, and so forth. So, so then what went wrong? I think, I think it is um, 
you have to put it on the judiciary, okay? That, that you know, the, the, the cases are there and then there's been this, this tilt towards a much more laissez-faire Chicago school, it seems certainly influenced by ideology. Um, and look, it's hardly the only area where the Supreme Court <laughs> has moved, you know, what are we gonna talk about campaign finance, you know, gerrymandering, you know, et cetera, right? So, so it's just an example of that. And then, the, you know, the lower courts too. Um, following okay so so that's the problem now in our system congress should fix it i guess because this is it's common law but it's statutory it, it's 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 not it's not constitutional it's statutory so so but uh, eh, congress isn't working so great necessarily these days either so there's that so how about the regulators well you know what would you this is just the whole economy you know i mean it's one thing to regulate a sector and that has its own difficulties I'm going to agree with Fiona. It's not a good way to go. So, um, so that's why we're in a bit of a pickle. There are way out, but 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 probably Congress for a lot of it. So let me just pick up on the regulators again um, uh, with one last question, which is that in addition to the antitrust laws, um, there are of course a lot of industry specific statutes out there that have competition effects and intentionally or unintentionally. So would the the gaming concerns, I think that, that you know, you've identified, would those be just as bad with, with regulations drawn in those industry specific statute contexts or worse uh, or better? Or, you know, how would you think about that question? I think in a, in a specific industry, it tends to be a bit better because firms are coming back again and again in front of the same regulator. And if the regulator says you may not pay for market access, and then the next week uh, the firm comes back and says, oh, we didn't pay, we just gave gold bars, or we didn't pay, we gave a supply agreement, or we didn't pay, we agreed not to launch an authorized generic. Those are all forms of payment. And if you're in front of the same regulator again and again, that regulator realizes that, and eventually you get some kind of punitive uh, harm, uh, punitive punishment or something else bad happens to you because you need that regulator uh, to, to carry out your business. So I think that tends to work a bit better. What we were discussing in response to your last question was replacing the general antitrust laws, which cover the entire economy, with rules that cover the entire economy. And that's, uh, that's much harder. I, I have to say, I'm very worried about regulatory capture when you get to sector-specific regulation. There's an, just a lot of evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was thinking just last week when the Biden administration released some oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, when I was on the CEA, we were talking about these things, you know, in the Obama administration and various disruptions, pipelines, other stuff like that. And the Jones Act was like always getting in the way because you couldn't move stuff from one place in the United States to another except on a U.S. flagged, owned, crewed ship. And, you know, this was something the long Shoreman and others, you know, got in the statute. So, and then, and then USDA has all sorts of rules that are anti-competitive, but they're meant to favor farmers or other particular groups. So, um, and the FCC history is not good on this. So, Department just, of Transportation. I, let's just oh, call them all out. The FDA. A bunch of our problems in airlines are, are, you know, there's often been fighting between DOJ and DOT because DOJ wants competition in airlines and DOT wants to keep the industry healthy, you know, um, as though these are in, in odd odds, you know, so, so I'm, I'm pretty worried about that already. So I have probed a little bit and maybe there's a little bit of disagreement here, which is great because <laughs> we would not want... <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't. Okay, so you agree. Oh, oh dear. Well, well, I have well, to find look, after probe we, have, we may have different views on, we get to a digital regulator, like I think we're both interested in that, but maybe have different degrees of nervousness about capture and bad, bad uh, effects. So, so, that well, we so get there. Let's, let's just jump to that then, because um, I, I think you're both very interested in the idea of a digital regulator, because digital platforms at the end of the day um, are an area where people are extremely interested in both exclusionary conduct and m a so um if we had some sort of digital regulator let me start with a specific question do you think it might have caught facebook's 2012 acquisition of instagram as potentially problematic 
just to throw something out there? So let's first discuss about what this digital regulator would uh -huh. do. Okay. Um, I think that the really serious problems that we have in this country uh, on, in digital are that there's just no basic rules. So think about the market for bread. When I go and buy bread, there are weights and measures. It's got to weigh what it says on the label. There's food purity laws. There's an ingredient list. There's a nutrition label. I know what I'm buying. And when I compare two loaves of bread, I am able to do that successfully because I have the information that I need. That's not true in the digital space. There's no rules about what people can take. There's long 20 pages of legalese that I have to agree to to get to the website. Then my stuff is sold and on and my information is sold on and I never know and so on. So there and security, there's hackers and Russians and whoever. So there, it, so the first thing I would have a regulatory authority do is take control of that and make the space safe for consumers and try to make a level playing field and some transparency so that entrants could come in and compete head to head with incumbents because they were offering a similar product because we understood what the product was. So, so that's, that's the first thing. Regulators don't tend to be doing mergers as their main activity. Uh, they tend to be doing things like deceptive advertising and, and what's safe for consumers and let's make sure the phones interconnect. So I would put privacy and security first. And then the other things I would tend to do would be um, some behavioral things like framing, dark patterns. Why should I be able to sign up to a service with one click, but I have to write a letter to, to, uh, to cancel it, or I have to click 12 times to cancel it. That kind of thing seems to me to be uh, wrong. And then there's also issues like interoperability. Uh, if Congress should decide that number independent messaging requires, uh, if you're big enough, you must interoperate with anybody who wants to interoperate with you, that's what the Europeans are about to do, then who's gonna determine whether that interoperability is being carried out the way Congress's instruction says to do it. So we, the FCC keeps track of whether phones uh, can all talk to each other. And, and if some phone operator were to make their system not compatible with DISH and DISH is trying to grow as, a, as an entrant, then that would, be, uh, that would be controlled by the regulator. So that, those would be the kinds of things that I would start with. And something like Instagram, I think actually would probably still be uh, covered by the antitrust authorities, just the way the Sprint T-Mobile merger was evaluated by the Department of Justice. Not, I mean, the FCC had to say, we're gonna transfer licenses, but DOJ stepped in and said, we're evaluating this. So I, sadly, I mostly agree with Fiona again, <laughs> but um, let, let me, I think, Look, there's obviously a huge amount of activity in DC now and, and Europe, Brussels for that matter, about digital regulation and worries about big tech. I am very concerned that there is just at the first step of doing public policy, people are, are going off, getting it wrong, which is the first thing is, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And then what's the problems, multiple problems, and then what are the proper tools, solutions, corrections? You know, problem, these problems cause some harms you want to go. So the main, look, malinformation is a huge problem. You know, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, okay? So it's not primarily a competition problem. It's something else. You know, we could talk about Section 230. I mean, I like these ideas of having some liability for actively propagating malinformation. It's not just a passive activity. Okay, but so, so that's one problem. Private, well, there's a lot of consumer protection type problems, the sort Fiona's talking about, privacy, trading information, who, who has the right to my information. A lot of people think I should, I should have more control over my own information. I, that's my view too. Well, that's not a competition problem. It's more of a consumer protection problem. So each problem, okay, you know, we have, we change section 230 maybe. We give the FTC more authority over consumer protection in digital because they already do consumer protection. Now, then, and are the competition problems? Well, those haven't been very well articulated, actually. I mean, you know, okay, we have some very big, powerful firms, but just want to get what are the harms and what are the ways to fix it? Is it inter is it mer stopping mergers? That's one thing. Interconnection might be another. That tends to be more regulatory, so that gets tricky. But I just think 
a lot of people are like, oh, big tech is too big, too powerful. We're ha we hate my Facebook, so we should do something, but it's not very well targeted. So, so let's take, I just, everybody, please take a breath and then figure out what are the harms? What's the appropriate solution? And a lot of it is regulation. It's interesting to me that Facebook, they run these big ads. I see them like, oh, we should have regulation. But of course, what do they mean by that? What do they mean by that? So, so uh, you have to then Let me quickly different say, solutions to different problems. When Carl says, what do they mean by that? What he means is a firm does not ask to have lower profits. So if Facebook is asking for regulation, it's because they think it's going to help them and query whether regulation that helps Facebook also helps consumers. I would argue that that's not necessarily true. So that's why we worry when Facebook asks to be regulated. That's, that's, that's a problem. But you know, right. content moderation is, I, I, my sense is that Facebook, Google, maybe Twitter, they're like, look, it's a really hard thing to do content moderation. Some people complain about us if we don't put their stuff up, other people if we do, it's a hard problem. It, I think they might actually welcome rules about it so that they didn't have, so they were, you know, particularly if that sheds them of liability and doesn't put them at any competitive disadvantage, but then, you know, what are those rules? So let, let me make the link to competition, Carl, because I think that there is one here. So one reason that Facebook is in so much trouble is because their content moderation is so terrible. And why is it so terrible? It's because they won't hire people to do it. They say, oh, we have 35,000 content moderators. But if when you have 3 billion users, that's pretty well nothing. And my understanding, and I can't remember where I read this, is that some huge proportion of those content moderators work on in Germany and on German content, because in Germany, if you put a Nazi thing on your site, it costs you a lot of money. And so Facebook has thousands of content moderators in Germany. And guess what? There isn't very much Nazi stuff on the site in Germany. So we know how to do this. And what it, but what is the problem with doing it? It would be expensive. It would be a marginal cost. And platforms don't like marginal costs. They like fixed costs. And so one of the things that might happen if there were more competition, if I could choose a, for my child to be on Facebook or a, comp, a competitor to Facebook, and the competitor to Facebook could let them talk to their aunts and uncles and friends because there was inter interconnection and interoperability. And that competitor to Facebook said, we run a whistle clean site that is really good for kids, okay? Then I would be putting my kids there. And that would take, that would create contestability for Facebook. They would lose customers. And then maybe they would invest in more content moderation because they wanted to keep people on the site. So I'm not sure that you need the government to create a rule for content moderation. Why don't we just have sites that are run for kids and sites that are run for conservatives and sites that are run for environmental, whatever. People should choose what they want but as long as they can talk to send messages to their friends, then it would be rather like email. Okay, I have an ISP and it filters junk in a certain way and I can write to anybody. Let's just say, it. So, so what we need is a system where Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they have an incentive not to propagate all this crap. And it's clearly not the case now. And that could be market incentives. We could hope for that, or it could be liability or something else the system is broken in that respect yeah exactly so yeah one interesting question and, and i don't know that we will get to the answer to this question is to the extent to which if we had their kind of robust competition that um that if you know you're envisioning whether we would end up having less harm at the end of the day because you know fewer people would be attracted to harmful information um because people you know, with self-select against that, you know, there's a question of, of, of human psychology there and one would hope that would be the case, um, but you know, there is that question. This is the very common um, criticism that is seeded by Facebook out into the world. And imagine if I told you that we were gonna have competition in cars, but there was no regulation of cars, no regulation of car safety. You would say, well, that sounds like a bad idea. There would be cars companies that wouldn't put in seat belts and they wouldn't install uh, airbags and maybe the brakes wouldn't work properly. And I don't think we should have competition in cars. Maybe we'd be better off with the big car monopoly uh, because they would tell us how their brake pads were really good and they were installing seat belts. Okay. 
that we don't have to make that choice. What if instead we had the National Highway Safety Transportation Authority and we required all cars to pass car tests and have seatbelts? Then we could have both safety and competition. Okay, so the idea that we should rely on the monopolist to obtain some benefits that we as a society would like to have is not consistent with how we've done something as a, done this as a country and illogical. I mean, we invent airplanes, we regulate airplanes. We invent trains, we regulate trains. We invent telephones, we regulate telephones. I mean, it's just normal. That's what we do. We invent medicines, we regulate medicines. So I, I just don't see why the, the narrative that we should rely on the monopolist to do this for us uh, makes any sense at all. So let, let me again agree, but put it in a different way that might be helpful. Take Facebook. We seem to we have have a monopoly, and a lot of crap. <laughs> okay, so well, there are two things we're talking about to fix it. One is competition. The other is regulation. I would argue you need both competition and regulation to get us to a good place. Either alone, I don't think actually competition alone. I'm not confident competition alone would do it. It might help, but it might not. Let's put it that way. And uh, regulation alone wouldn't make me very happy either. So I really think we need both and it shouldn't be picking one or the other. Thank you very much. Exactly, exactly. Think about cars, okay? We didn't invent the car and say, wow, you know, this is an amazingly dangerous thing. Let's, uh, let's ban it because uh, it's too dangerous. No, we made crosswalks and traffic lights and driver's licenses and seatbelts. And Nor did we say, this is very dangerous, so we're gonna designate one company to make them and watch them very closely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so here's a question from the um, audience that I think that, uh, that ties in a little bit to what we were talking about just now. Um, so let's say we do have this nice mix of competition and regulation. Should um, the regulatory compliance by smaller firms be subsidized in some way, at least as they're beginning to grow? And then at some point, maybe they graduate out of the subsidy on the theory that we want to encourage smaller firms to compete, but maybe it's harder for them to, to comply and therefore we can subsidize them in some way. I don't, subsidies tend to put me off unless uh -huh. it's something with really generating a lot of positive externalities, okay. But I would I would go more with just, just from thinking more generally about regulation. Look, it does tend to impose the fixed costs to comply and that's a problem for smaller firms. So that's a problem. We don't wanna, we don't wanna, you know, you know and startups, let's say. I would rather have it be more light, much cheaper regulation when you're small and then not a subsidy, but just easier. And then when you get big, you're subject to additional duties. You have to, you know, you have to jump through more hoops or, or, or whatever. I, I would think about it more that way rather than the subsidy word. Yeah, I would think about lots of regulations we have that uh, small businesses are exempt from. For example, mm -hmm. um, when they grow and get bigger, they become required to, to comply. And you can imagine that their small businesses don't have to, uh, if, if in the digital space, would be not reporting all their A-B testing, whereas a big firm might have to report all their A-B testing. Let me say that regulation, we, in America, we often use the term regulation as if it is just bad and it's bad for firms. When, uh, when we think about an interoperability regulation in social networks, that enables a small firm to compete on the same playing field as Facebook. It enables them to enter and grow and get customers without having to solve the network effects by themselves. So it's very pro-competitive and a small firm doesn't have to enter with a platform of we're doing content moderation. I'd love a small firm to enter social networks with a, with a, um, a subscription model, pay me and we're not going to advertise to you. And, and uh, you know, something like that might not require enormous economies of scale to be effective. So there's a whole, uh, in general, Businesses are amazingly creative and there's all different directions they might go. And if you lower entry barriers, uh, I think uh, that's the best, that's the best approach. So speaking of entry barriers, let's talk a little bit about data. I know that both of you are very interested in data and the ways in which data is, um, has become a, a, a very large <laughs> entry barrier. Um, so how does it fit into 
the competitive challenge faced by a potential um, disruptor in the digital platform space? And how do we deal with it? <laughs> I mean, it obviously creates barriers, um, just, or can anyway. Well, I'll take the first crack. Um, the, first off, there's, there's a hell of a lot of different sources of data for different businesses. You know, Expedia works with all sorts of hotel chains and, and um, uh, airline companies to get the data from them. So, you know, that, that's so they can offer better, you know, and, and then sell their advertising to get customers. Obviously, Google gets a huge amount of data from the queries they handle. And so they, that allows them to more effectively handle particularly rare or tail queries because they have all that experience. Um, you know, Amazon has a different set of data. So there's it just, this is, you know, as some people say, it's the new oil, right? It's the raw material to do so much stuff, particularly with AI being, you know, so impressive and powerful. Um, I think this, it, you know, it's, it, you can call it a entry barrier. I guess I would, which that's a word that isn't well defined by a lot of people. I would just say it can give a big competitive advantage to an incumbent who has a lot of data. And, um, but there are entrants often can find, you know, get their own, there are other ways to acquire data or get data too. Um, in some sense, a big regulatory issue, I think people are talking about is, do we want to fo either force incumbents to share some data with entrants, which is a bit heavy handed, but obviously could help entry or related if, what about the users? And like, if they had more control over their own data, they could say, oh, I'd like to, my data to be shared with the entrant incumbent supplier, I'm instructing you to do so. That seems pretty desirable to me. So there's different tools here. I agree with that. I think uh, data portability is something a regulator could really do a good job with. We see in open banking in the UK that that has worked like a charm. People can take data from one bank to another. They can enable a FinTech application to access the data in their bank account. This is creating a lot of value. And that enhances competition, by the way, also between banks, because an entering bank can say, come to me, and instead of a big switching cost to take to start up an account and run them both at the same time and train the other firm on what you like, you just boom, overnight move everything. So portability is very important. I would also um, highlight for listeners the way that the Europeans have dealt with use restrictions on data. So an example of this would be, I give my data to Amazon so they can mail me a package. That means that Amazon can use that data to mail me a package and they cannot use it to start a video business because that's a different use. And when there's unrestricted uses, it's an almost an artificial uh, economies of scope that you're giving to a firm to just do everything. Now, now if, if Google has a profile on every single person in America, they may be better at starting a business of every single type in America because they already know what people want. And is that something that we want to allow as a society or should we say, well, I've given data, I've given Google my personal uh, interest through a search query and they can use that to return to me this, the answer to my search query, but they can't use it to sell me an ad over here in a different place or uh, figure out what video I should be watching. You know, I like to think of this somewhat in terms of property rights. Um, you know, I, I personally find it very appealing that individuals should have strong rights over the, their own data um, so that data can't be used without their permission. Um, but then I think the hard part comes when the company says, oh, our terms of service are that you agree to let us use the data all these ways. And it's buried on page five somewhere and no, who can tell, right? So do you want to make those property rights that you, you, you um, something the supplier, the firm has to jump through more hoops to, to, before you relinquish it. Uh, one of the companies says, you know, we, and, and we're not going to share it with anybody else. Can you, is, maybe you shouldn't be allowed, they like, shouldn't be allowed to take that part of it away from you. So you kind of, what's in, are the things inalienable? Are they tradable? It's, it's very tricky, um, but it really matters. And I don't know, Fiona, whether you think, is this, should we have a regulator setting those rules? I guess it's kind of like consumer protection. Maybe you need that. I think it is like consumer protection. And then there's this piece that the economists aren't so good at, which is 
do I have an inalienable right to something in the way that I shouldn't, we shouldn't allow people to sell their kidneys or something? Is there, is there something that I should not be able to choose to share or be exploited about? And then what else should I be allowed to choose so that I can design my experience online the way I want it to be? But I do think it's akin to consumer protection and that, again, a, a set of rules that all firms had to abide by would be really helpful because then we would know what we were getting. And an entrant, we, we'd understand what an entrant had to do to, to be able to compete. And that would help us understand competition better and enable it more where we wanted to. And I, see, I, I must say, I find it appealing that if I give my data to a company and they do some clever things with it, with other data, you know, that's something they added some value. I'm kind of inclined that that's their stuff. But if they tell me, but if I say, oh, I want you to share just my data, just the raw data you had for me with some other competitor, if they're trying to block that, I don't like that. That's kind of like exclusive dealing. It's like, wait, it's not yours, it's my data. You know, I don't want, you necessarily have to share all the cool stuff you created because I don't want to stifle that. But my, my raw data, no, I want somebody else to have it too. So I would see rules against that type of, or, or which is equally saying, they have to cooperate with data transfer if the user wants it. And of course, subject to the delicacies of privacy issues. So that relates to a question that um, a couple of people have asked about data, which is, you know, particularly in the era of machine learning and um, related utilities that help us get um, huge benefits, allegedly at least, from large amounts of very complete data sets. How do we deal with that question? Um, I mean, I think that both of you have been kind of suggesting that there is an abundance of data and we can have alternatives in lots of different contexts for data. But what if you need, for example, all the scientific articles that have been written on a particular issue. Um, that may not raise privacy concerns, but there could be other um, barriers to collecting all that data. Um, and or that was, that was actually for copyright issues, a big deal, for example, in Google Books, mm -hmm. it comes up a lot of the time um, because of copyright issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And so I suppose then, then the question is, um, more specifically, if somehow we one entity does manage to collect all of that data, should it be considered some sort of essential utility for everyone at that point? Um, and maybe this is where- again, It's very difficult to design incentives to invest in and understand the data if you say, look, we're just gonna take whoever's got it all and make them into a regulated thing. I guess my feeling is because we have been so slow to make rules about data, it's not clear to me that that entity should have all of that data. That if we went back and said, actually, Fiona controls her data, it's an inalienable right or something like that, then I'd be inclined to say, anybody who has collected my data has to delete it because I didn't, I didn't give permission in the way that we're now thinking is required, which is some kind of understandable eighth grade English behavioral economics framed uh, choices that I get to make. And then nobody would have it and we'd have a level playing field. So I'd rather go that way than say, there's all this data and Google has a super profile on me and now we're gonna regulate who gets access to the super profile. I, I didn't agree to that. I, I don't want that. Well, I, I, a level playing field where, where everybody's stuck in the mud does not seem like a good game to me, okay? I'd rather have, um, I guess I, I, want, I want, look, accumulating huge amounts of data is extremely valuable because of what machine learning can do with it. Now, of course, they can do terrible things with it too, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of good things and that's another set of regulations, you know, algorithmic bias and who knows what. But um, I guess I want to facilitate companies gathering that data subject to individuals giving their permission, but I don't want the incumbents to be the only ones who can do it. I want the disruptors as well. That's the principle kind of in our paper. Carl, now you're a little stuck because the horse has left the, the mud. What, what are you gonna do with the horse that's left the barn? I'm, I think we agree <laughs> about the horses who are in the barn. If we close the door and we have some rules about that and it's all fine. 
but the problem is that 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 the horses have left the barn. That's too hard for me to solve right now. <laughs> It's too early in the morning in California right now. Um, so we're getting some interesting audience questions and we got some at the very beginning that allow us to zoom out a little bit more as well. Um, so I started out by saying a, a little something about um, how we weren't going to be simplistic and just say big is bad. Um, but maybe I put words in your mouth to some extent. I don't know whether that that's you know, to what extent you agree or don't agree, and particularly given that there are so many um, uh, perspectives out there that would suggest um, that that big is bad is a good idea um, as just a, as a basic heuristic anyway. Um, could you comment <laughs> on whether in fact you, you have uh, agree with, if at all, with the perspective that big is bad. Let Carl start with that one. <laughs> I do not. I do not at all. Look, the, in the NHS, we have the group sometimes called the Neo-Brandeisians who are pushing to deconcentrate the economy in lots of markets. Brandeis himself um, is a brilliant man. He did believe that, he did not believe in economies of scale. He thought that the big companies tended to be inefficient this was his experience growing up in the Midwest and then and as a lawyer in Boston, fighting railroad companies and the like. Empirically, we know in the last century that there are enormous economies of scales and our economy over the last 20, 30, 40 years, even more economies of scales because of network effects, because of intellectual property. That's the world we live in, okay? And globalization. So there are these very powerful forces that are giving advantages to big firms and they're taking a bigger share of the economy because they're efficient. I mean, not the only reason, but there's a significant element of that. So big is bad is, is both, both contrary to very fundamental long lasting economic forces and deconcentrating if one tried to break things up, it would be enormously damaging. What are we gonna do in semiconductors? What, what are you talking about? It costs $10 billion to build a fab these days what are we supposed to have? A bunch of little firms doing it? Mom and pop semiconductor makers? This doesn't make sense, okay? So, so no, the trick is to harness the efficiency of big firms, but still have disruption and competition as best we can. So I have a different slogan. Rather than break them up, my slogan is make them compete. Okay? Because I think that make them compete covers things like don't buy nascent acquisition. Let's have data portability so that the banks have to compete for me. Let's have interoperability so that the social network has to compete for me. Let's not let Sprint and T-Mobile merge because I think they should have to compete with each other. Let's not let the Department of Transportation allow American and JetBlue to code share because they should be competing with each other. There are many, many ways to make firms compete that go across antitrust and regulation. And I think that's a better way to think about it because somebody's market share is a really imperfect proxy for what's going on in that industry. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. No, I think the make the compete is great. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Catchy. I, look, I, I do think the, there is a, uh, historically, uh, we often have this American view that while we love business and are skeptical of government, we don't like big business. You know, they drive out small mom and pop shops. They, you know, they, there's loss of local control. And we're seeing that in the populace now that this, this has really emerged because of inequality and the other dysfunctions in our country. And so we're seeing that again, but it's not a, uh, trying to deconcentrate broadly is not a uh, workable uh, or smart strategy to deal with these problems. So make them compete. I'm gonna pick up your slogan. And getting back to some of the institutional mechanisms by which we could make them compete, are there, um, I know that, you know, legislation is always a challenge, but are there any particular proposals in Congress that you find are, are would, would tend to favor that make them compete philosophy? Mm -hmm. 
Um, as I mentioned before, Senator Klobuchar has an antitrust statute, which I think is excellent and rolls back a lot of the incorrect decisions by courts and strengthens the way we do antitrust. So that's a general purpose um, uh, statute. I am also quite fond of the Access Act uh, introduced by Senator Blumenthal and others that requires interoperability in the way I was talking about it before. And they have a companion app store bill that I think is pretty good also in the make them compete uh, sense. Um, so these are, uh, I, I would say that my, in general, I prefer statutes that cover the whole economy. I think sector by sector regulation is, it, we want competition everywhere and pharma and airlines and digital. So it's better to do it that way. But if you're going to make a digital proposal, I think interoperability is my favorite because it does, it does not tell firms what attributes to have. It just tells them they have to connect, that the big firm has to connect. It enables entry. It is particularly important in a digital context, I think. Uh, interoperability is often a thing that, um, that matters and it's quite light touch. It's the format of the interface. It's not an expensive. So I like those kinds of proposals. Carl, did you want to add anything there? Or? Oh, sure, a little bit. First, I think Fiona and I and another group, we have supported the antitrust bill by, by the, introduced by Senator Klobuchar. So that's, there's definitely, and this, this relates to our discussion of the common law and what the courts have done. Mm -hmm. And so it's a corrective to that. Um, uh, I, I, I have endorsed that, so is Fiona. Um, in terms of the tech stuff and the interoperability and the like, um, I think it's hard to do well. I'm sympathetic to just the sort of thing, to be honest. I'm more skeptical about doing it in a light touch effective way. Let me just say, so I'm worried about that. I think if you're gonna do these things, you need a regulatory agency to do it. I don't think the Article Three courts are well suited because you need ongoing oversight and there's technical issues and enforcement and so forth. And so, so you need, if you're gonna go that route, I would just say, Congress, please be thoughtful about the, the complications, recognize technology changes, and you can't write it all down. <laughs> so you need to delegate it to a regulatory agency and they need to be well resourced and um, uh, and hopefully well run, you know, that's gonna depend on appointments um, uh, with a pretty clear mission uh, that, that's, that's well defined and again, well resourced because this is not easy. Are there any international uh, um examples of agencies that are beginning to operate in this space that you think are are good examples um, since we don't currently have a digital regulator? Yes. Yes, I love the CMA in the UK. Yep, that's I think the, they, they're the leader here. That's the best one to look at, UK CMA. Yep, and that they started to form a digital capability a couple of years ago. They started hiring more people who understand algorithms, more people who are capable of dealing with really enormous data sets. Um, that has turned into legislation, which is going to create an actual unit and there and some regulations inside that agency. So it's a competition authority, but they are going to take particular firms that that satisfy the criteria laid down by parliament and create regulations for them of this kind. That is to say, maybe a network would be required to interoperate, maybe uh, something else would be required to um, have an algorithm that didn't bias the results a certain way and that would be checked up on by the CMA. Uh, so I think they're doing a very pro-competitive regulatory approach, which I love. I, I totally want to endorse that. I tell everybody, look at what they're doing. And there's a couple elements I would flag. First off, they're very explicit that this is experimental. They're gonna try it, see how it works and learn, okay? Because it's fluid, it's dynamic, technologies changes. And what works for you know Google isn't gonna be the same as for Apple or whatever, okay? So they, they understand that. Um, the other thing is they've been exemplary in working with the industry, okay? Now working with the industry, you make, oh, capture, whatever. No, it's not how I've seen it so far from what I know about it. It's more, they found there's a lot of very detailed studies and reports they've already, so as they've gotten a lot of input. So 
they're not shooting in the dark. They're they're thoughtful. Look, you need look, you need look, you don't take what the industry says, you know, swallow it whole, but you listen and you figure it out. And I think they've done that. And this is why Congress can't do that. It has to be a regulator. It's an ongoing process. And if you just Congress says do this and then turns it over to the courts, it's gonna be a mess. <laughs> Right. Let's. I'll, I'll highlight. I think their App Store study should come out any day now. But a year ago, they put out a study on ad-supported platforms. So that was Google and Facebook, and they put out an interim report, hundreds of pages long, and then took comments from the companies. And the interim report says, "Here's what we think's going wrong by way of competition." Then the companies are allowed to respond and show data and come in and explain stuff to them. The final report wasn't very different from the interim report, so I think their companies were not able to provide much that the CMA hadn't already seen. But that process, as Carl says, results in a large team that's very well informed about what's happening in that industry and already has some ideas about changes that would remove the lowest hanging fruit of problems. And exactly if you're setting yourself up to learn, that's what you want to do first. Like, let's do the obvious stuff. See how that works out. Go back, uh, refine, get better. And related, the CMA a couple of years ago commissioned a study of their, um, their uh, merger control decisions in digital markets. And including, for particular, actually, Facebook, Instagram, also Google Waze, Priceline Kayak, uh, and a couple others. So... So they're also looking at, there's this issue, right? Have, have the antitrust authorities missed a bunch of these deals over the time? You know, this has been, mm -hmm. has it been a, a blind spot. So they're looking at that. Um, the FTC did not the same thing. They looked at non-HSR reportable transactions, which is useful, but, but the, the, again, the, the CMA is, that's exactly what you wanna do. Like, okay, how did these work out? Did we miss some stuff, an honest assessment? And they were somewhat critical of it. It was an outside study of their own decisions actually. Um, so, so that's a place to look. Brussels, we'll see. The Digital Markets Act, that's another place. They're moving much faster than the U.S. with legislation. So you asked internationally. That's, and we, we have the, we have the um, uh, of course, their, their GDPR already in terms of, of privacy rules. So I think for better or worse in the U.S., maybe it'll be better because we get to see what other jurisdictions do well or poorly but I'm more concerned we're just stuck and we're on it, we're dysfunctional. <laughs> so, um, but while we're dysfunctional, other countries, particularly um, again, UK and the e EU are moving gonna take the lead. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's really too bad. I think we're gonna sit here and those of us who travel to Europe or have European friends are gonna see an improved level of service there and more competition. They may have small and medium sized enterprises that can take off because some of these entry barriers are lowered. Um, I don't know whether that will cause those similar enterprises in Tennessee and Nebraska to say to their senators, hey, how about we have this law too? Um, but generally Congress doesn't do anything in this country, so I'm <laughs> Well, that, that does create a little bit of a damper in terms of trying to adopt some of the models from overseas um, that do require some legislation, but... Um, why don't I ask you if you have any closing thoughts? I don't want to leave on the Congress doesn't do anything in this country note. So if you have any other thoughts you uh, wanted to convey, um, you've both done an incredibly interesting um, and, and a great job of, of answering all the interesting questions that have come in from the audience. And um, your affirmative uh, proposals are also very interesting. Um, but if there's anything that, that you haven't gotten to say, please, this is your moment. This was really fun. Thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This was really, really helpful. And I oh, think that I'm we will- uh, I'll oh, just ahead. say, rah, rah for disruptors, make them compete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make that a bumper sticker and <laughs> put it on my car. <laughs> I like that. I do like that. It's, it's, it's got a lot of, it's, it's very catchy. Um, all right. Well, thanks so, so much. Um, and thanks to the audience um, for your great questions. And this is our last conversations on innovation uh, for this year.
And in March, we will be having a conference on the university's role in innovation in the innovation ecosystem that we will um, uh, be advertising um, as we get closer to the date. So thanks again and uh, see you next year.